Next Gen Fam, welcome back to Mentor Momentum, the podcast where we break down career and life inside from some of the world's best and brightest. And today is no exception. We have an absolute powerhouse lined up for you. But before we even get into today's episode, I want to remind everybody to get in the comments. Let us know what questions you want asked. I got my eyes peeled, so fire them off. We'll be making sure to ask them to today's guest. Uh, but without further ado, I know a lot of next geners have been buzzing about cryptocurrency and we had to oblige and this is just going to be an absolutely epic episode diving into so many good insights here. So this week's guest is among the leading and most recognizable figures in the cryptocurrency space. He is the founder and CEO of Ballet, a startup that provides a more user friendly physical wallet for storing cryptocurrency. He's also the co-founder of BTCC the longest running Bitcoin exchange and leading financial platform worldwide. And he's had stints at both Yahoo and Walmart under his belt, an entrepreneurial familial background. We have so much to dive into and, and I want to talk about it all. So I'm going to shut up, welcome him to the stage. I got to welcome my man, Bobby Lee. Thank you so much, Bobby, for joining us here on Mentor Momentum. Hi, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Bobby, I want to dive in right away uh, and, and take you back to, you know, you're one of the earliest pioneers in the cryptocurrency world, perhaps only outdone by your brother, Charlie, uh, who got you into the, into the mix. Can you talk to us about the early days and how you started to get into uh, cryptocurrency and what it was like back in, you know, kind of the early 2010s, if you will? Yeah, the early days were quite interesting. It was a very hobbyist mentality. These days, I cryptos all over the world. It's all in the media. There's a lot of governments and regulators, regulators involved and uh, all sorts of trading and speculation and all that stuff. But back then, it was really a hobbyist. Uh, I remember in 2011, you know, there was just maybe just very few miners, you know, were mining with, with at the time, what we considered very advanced, uh, using GPUs to to sort of uh, get around the, the speed of the CPU and we plug in like you know multiple graphics card into a single PC just to run this program to mine Bitcoin. It was uh, in the summer of 2011. I remember doing that, and it was uh, you had to you know had to run your own sort of build your own install of Linux, uh, and then uh, had to you know do do run the scripts and get the get the programs running. Uh, so it was very much a a sort of a geek hobbyist kind of uh, situation back then. Yeah. But I feel like, Bobby, it wasn't even your first foray into uh, virtual currencies. You you actually worked on virtual currencies when you were at Yahoo, right? Yes, yes. So Yahoo at the time, I was uh, I was a senior engineering manager. I, I was there for eight years. Wow. And towards the latter few years of my tenure there, I I had the opportunity to oversee the sort, sort of virtual currency platform. We call it the VCP, virtual currency platform. But at the time, you know, again, virtual currencies is very different from today's cryptocurrency, which is decentralized. Back then, virtual currencies were, were much more like those in-game sort of gold coins, mm -hmm. you know, the World mm -hmm. of Warcraft, that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was all centralized. Yahoo, the idea was Yahoo would issue and use virtual currencies on the platform. Mm -hmm. We didn't really launch a product per se, but it was uh, sort of the early stages of looking into it in the early 2000s. And, and how did that inform as you, you know, kind of grew into this space of crypto? How were you able to use that learning to kind of take you into the <laughs> new world? Well, the learning is that the, the old approach was wrong, right? What mm -hmm. I realized after I, I, and to be very honest with you, when we were doing virtual currencies, the, the notion of a decentralized solution was just not even in my mind. I don't know if it was in anyone's mind, but at least it was not in my mind, very honestly speaking. So when Bitcoin came around, it's like, what? This is a solution that has no central authority? You know, Charlie and I were like, uh, that's weird. You know, yeah. <laughs> we've heard yeah. of technologies like peer to peer. We've heard of, mm. you know, the, the notion of uh, using a mesh network, you know, uh, you know, fault tolerant, that kind of stuff, peer to peer technologies. Uh, the proof of work concept was new, but it was understandable. It was hashing functions and trying to solve, solve for an equation, right? That's understandable. Yeah. But the whole idea of putting it together with the concept of blockchain, you know, signatures of transactions and having units of Bitcoin having upper limit eight, uh, 21 million. So that was all foreign. And that was all like something, you know, I was like asking like, is, is this, what, what's the deal? Why, why do it this way? Yeah. So we were questioning whether it would have value in the future. So we're back then we're novices, newbies, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the same questions newbies ask themselves today. Mm. Mm. Can we dive in a bit there? And, and uh, from your insight, um, what are the key things that, you know, people should know or, or where should they turn to? Um, to your point, you know, there are tons of newbies out there. You know, I have, uh, you know, 
family members, friends who are like, all right, man, what is this whole thing? Um, where, where would you direct people to first? Well, so this is, this is good timing. So that's why I wrote this book. Okay. So this is exactly why I wrote this book. People always ask me, where can I learn more about Bitcoin? Where can I learn more about this? And I just don't have the time to give a two hour lecture to every person I meet. Uh, even, even the two hour lecture is not enough. So, so I finally, three years ago, I started this project, this book project, and I got my act together late, late last year to really wrap it up put all the chapters together. So finally got it published. Today is a publishing date. Today, May 18th, 2021. Wow. I'm very proud. This is now on Amazon, hardcover, 30 bucks. Uh, it's also on Kindle. It's going to be available in Audible, uh, audiobook format later this summer. And I think a few, a few countries have already ordered translations of it. Wow. But, uh, so it's very exciting. So essentially, now with this in hand, I can say, hey, read my book. If I see you, I might give you a copy. Uh, or if, if not, you can buy it yourself on Amazon or your favorite book retailer all around the country. So the, the book is really aimed for the mainstream sort of casual audience. It's not for geeks, even yeah. though I have a very technical, strong computer science background. This is written for everyday people, just like my wallet. The Valley Wallet is made for everyday people. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a, found a passion in educating and bringing the knowledge and bringing the, the love of cryptocurrency of Bitcoin to everyday people. So I really, that's, that's sort of my core audience. That's the, the people I like talking to. Yeah, absolutely. I was noticing too, and, and in reading, uh, and, and first congrats on the book. I mean, yes, man, I got you. you on the launch day, which is exciting. Um, I was reading, you know, kind of the cover and the, you know, word, little words on Amazon and obviously your huge passion for wanting to help everybody get access to this market. Um, at the highest level, what, what are strategies for people just trying to like get in the door and understand, um, how to even like play in this space. If you could give like the high level yeah. summary of what people can expect from the book. Yeah. So aside from buying the book and reading it, that's probably step zero to, to be <laughs> intrigued enough to take action because most people have heard of cryptocurrency. They, 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 mm -hmm. they're curious what I call Bitcoin curious, but they've never really delved into it. So buying the book, reading it is the first step because you're spending real money and real time investing in, in sort of learning about Bitcoin. Once you've done that, the next important step is actually monumental, which is, to own Bitcoin for the first time. And mm -hmm. before I, you know, I, I was, obviously I'm not an investment advisor, but I do do tell people, I think Bitcoin is a, is an investment of our lifetime. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the thing is Bitcoin, you have to be aware Bitcoin is very, very volatile. It trades like crazy. There are all these speculators trading Bitcoin up and down. So from where it is now, it's at, you know, 40 some thousand dollars, uh, yeah. hopefully $50,000 soon. Uh, and then, where it will be, you know, whatever the future price is, it's going to be a lot more than it is today, in my opinion. Uh, there's also always a risk to go to zero, but I don't, I don't believe that myself. Mm -hmm. And of course, it came from zero. So for something to have come from zero to this ultimate point, you know, this yeah. is a, a, a huge rise through some time, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. And it's going to go up and down like this. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have these huge cycles where it goes up a lot, it goes down a lot. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're in this cycle right now. We think we're in a sort of bull market year for 2021. So be prepared. Basically, the point is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't take your life savings from Bitcoin. But rather, for most people, 1% or 2% of their net wealth, no problem, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and plus, um, the best time to invest is actually now in the sense that that's when you have the conviction, when you have the desire to do it, it's the best time to do it. Uh, don't try to wait for the market price to come down because when the prices do come down, it will, by the way, it will correct. Every, whenever the price goes up, it can come down. When mm -hmm. it does correct, that's when you lose the momentum and lose the sort of desire to buy Bitcoin. So a lot of people make that mistake. Bobby, you make it so, uh, you know, you're, you're living your, your message, man. You're making it so easy and accessible for people to understand. I think, you know, what's so daunting is um, you hear tons of people throwing all their money in Bitcoin, doubling down. Oh, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're making it, it's, it's, uh, it's part of your investment strategy and obviously not an investment professional. So not taking the word as gospel that you're sharing, but just being able to see a, a different perspective that I think is so refreshing in the space. I, I've gotten to read a bit about where you think, the market is going and some of those ups and downs. And, and you've even predicted that you think by uh, 2028, it might even surpass the market cap of gold. Um, well, yeah, certainly. I think so. Can you, can you share a bit about what you're seeing and, and why that, you know, some people might look at you and be like, Bobby, that's crazy, man. No way. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so when you measure Bitcoin and gold, people make the mistake. So one ounce of gold, like one ounce coin is, you know, what is it? 
1700 1800 dollars 1800 and the bitcoin today is over what is it 40 43000 dollars but you don't measure one bitcoin one unit of bitcoin with an ounce of gold right because if you measure it in a kilogram of gold a kilogram of gold is actually priced higher than bitcoin today whereas an ounce is only $1,800. So my point is a kilogram of Bitcoin is over $60,000, whereas Bitcoin is only 43,000. So how do you measure it properly? The way to measure properly is to unit to what I call standardize the unit, right? Unif mm -hmm. Make that uniform. In this case, the only way to do it is to calculate the whole value. So if you take all of Bitcoin, all 18 and a half million Bitcoin, the value comes out to about 900 billion to a trillion dollars, depends on the day. Whereas gold is 10 times that gold is like $10 trillion. So the question I tell people, the question, the issue at hand is, will, can Bitcoin ever surpass gold in the sense that can the total value of Bitcoin surpass the 10 trillion that gold is today? Or maybe by then gold is 15 trillion. Can it surpass 15 trillion? And I think it can. I think, mm -hmm. I, think uh, I don't know where you read, but probably 2028, I've said that at some point. Yeah, probably um, that's just seven years away. I think, I think it easily can surpass gold in the next seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you, you're spot on that people do look at it and say, all right, obviously, if I have like a ton of gold, it's got to be worth more than, than Bitcoin. And I think people, you know, breaking it down and being able to actually compare apples to apples, which, you know, talk exactly. about, of, uh, yeah, the, the stuff we learned growing up that's now being employed, you know, into um, actual real world practice. It seems like you've been able to, um, and time and time again, simplify it so that everyday individual can understand uh, Bitcoin and, and really be able to utilize it. And I want to get into ballet in a second here because I think it does just that. But before we even get there, I, I want to talk a bit about BTCC and obviously one of the oldest standing, uh, you know, platforms uh, out there right now. What in your mind was like kind of the, the story of getting started there and, and really delving in uh, you and the founding team to be like, hey, this can sure. be something that can really succeed. Yeah, so BTCC actually started off as a company called BTC China. It was China's very first Bitcoin exchange. It was launched in 2011 by two of my co-founders uh, in China. <clears throat> and uh, it was really the first exchange website that serviced the China market, that allowed people to trade Bitcoin in the local currency B. At the time, there was no regulation. You know, it was all free for all. There were no banks, relationships, anything like that. No regulatory agencies at all. So... Mm -hmm. So basically, I, and that's the same year, I got started mining Bitcoin. I didn't know the founders at the time, but <clears throat> excuse me, two years later in 2013, early 2013, I decided to jump in, you know, head first into this and take it on as full time. So I was one of the very, very earliest entrepreneurs to sort of do Bitcoin full time earlier than, you know, earlier than my brother, earlier than many people out there. Um, so I contacted these two guys and said, Hey, I want to, I want to do something. Let's turn this into a real company. At the time it was a hobbyist website, a part-time thing. Yeah. So my proposal to them was I want to invest some money, you know, buy some shares in the company, become co-founder, CEO, and go fundraising, raise venture capital and really grow this into a powerhouse. And so soon enough, they, they signed on to my vision. And by the springtime, we, we got an investment from Lightspeed, uh, China partners, um, and, and launched a company, right, in the company form. That was launched in 2013. Um, and, and then the rest is history. We actually, we actually sold the company yeah. in 2018. It was acquired in 2000, early 2018, uh, over three years ago. So I have since left the management team, but uh, I think they, the, the new owners take it on. They're still running it. Uh, yeah, so I'm proud to be part of that history. Yeah. And I, I learned a heck of a lot uh, mm -hmm. in, those year, in those five years running an exchange, a mining pool, and also yeah. a custodial wallet. Yeah. yeah, I want to definitely dive into some of your lessons. But before that, can can you talk a bit about um, how you, you know, you're obviously you're speaking to an entrepreneur audience. How did you have the conviction to know, hey, I'm going to put my own money into this and we're really yeah. going to make it? Yeah, so I'll tell you how this works. So, so what happened is um, even as early as 2011, I remember distinctly, uh, during one of my business trips in the U I was working for Walmart uh, for e-commerce in China. Mm. So I was working for Walmart and we flew to the U S for a business trip, visit the head headquarters in Arkansas, Bentonville. Um, so during that trip, you know, I said to myself at the time, it sounded silly. It was like, Oh, if I ever do a startup, I would do it in Bitcoin. So that sort of planted the seed. It was my, my verbal commitment, my, ver my me verbalizing that sentence to a friend sort of uh, planted that seed in my head. Uh, that if I ever did a startup, I would do it in Bitcoin. And fortune would have it, you know, a year and a half later, I left Walmart. 
Uh, and then I was trying to figure out what to do next. And obviously the, the, the right thing to do would be to jo go join another company, be a tech executive, get an even higher salary, even bigger title and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, I, I remember back two years prior to that, that I said, or it was actually a year and a half prior to that. I said, Hey, I should do a startup doing in Bitcoin. That's when I said, maybe I should look into this. This was at towards the end of 2012, uh, early 2013. That's when I, uh, sort of decided to, you know, rekindle that idea to start a company and to, to do that. So my message to entrepreneurs is, you know, have conviction, you know, it's okay to, to dream big. Um, the idea of entrepreneurial entrepreneurialism is, is you have to be ready to fail. You have to, you have to be willing to take a risk and every risk you take can fail. And you got to be open-minded to that, right? When I joined BTC, C, uh, BTC China, when I joined my co-founders to do it, there was, in my mind, there was, there was absolutely, I knew we could fall flat on our face. But at yeah. the same time, I believed in Bitcoin enough to say it's worth it. It's worth the risk to try it, to launch a company, to build an exchange, see if we can build the global powerhouse and really make it happen. And in some ways, we, we did. We, we became the world's largest uh, exchange by trading volume by, by within, you know, by the end of that year, uh, we surpassed Mt. Gox trading volume. And uh, we did have a lot of competitors crop, crop up in China. It was just vastly, uh, vastly competitive landscape. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot and uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot, not mm -hmm. just in terms of running a company, being an entrepreneur, but I learned a lot also just about Bitcoin, about economics, about uh, um, what it means to be a libertarian, you know, believer in freedom, uh, the individualism, and also, you know, the, the right to money, right? Freedom of money. What mm -hmm. is money, right? That, that was a lesson that, that I'm keep, I, I keep learning about today. Mm -hmm. So it's been a 10 year, uh, it's been a 10 year journey. This is my 10th year wow. uh, anniversary of learning about Bitcoin. Wow. Bobby, it's so cool. You, you know, even from the beginning hearing um, the verbal commitment that you make to your friend that then reminds you, all right, if I'm going to leave Walmart, I'm going to give this thing a try. And, and you do, and you're able to build it out. Uh, and, and even today, you know, you talk about this mentality of continuing to learn, which I think is so impactful for our audience to see, you know, obviously young entrepreneurs wanting to get out, get their hands dirty and, and hearing from you that it's a continuous journey that you can always. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid to fail and just keep learning and keep, keep climbing up and doing better. One thing we love to talk about here is, is mistakes and failures and the lessons that we can learn from them. And I, I got to imagine as you guys were getting started back in 2012, all the way to 2018, there have to have been some errors, mistakes, things that you learned throughout the way. Is there perhaps one that sticks out in a lesson uh, that, that you would want to share with the next generation so they can avoid the same mistakes or failures that you might have made? Yeah, I, I would say it's about um, it's about so so. Let me let me share an insight that that is not well uh, often spoken of. We uh, we got BTCC. We got our acquisition offer at the end of 2017, and the deal closed in 2018. That's when it uh, mm -hmm. formalized, uh, changed hands, change of control in early January 2018. But we got the offer, the full offer in December, in November, December of the of the 2017, right during the peak of the bull market. Now it turns out, you know, having an, a company being acquired for, for multi, multi-million dollars is a lot of, is, is great honor, a lot of fun. We made money as entrepreneurs, we made money for investors, our employees made money. Everyone's very happy. Um, but what people don't realize is we actually had a failed acquisition attempt a year earlier. So in, in 2016, at the end of 2016, we had another acquisition offer um, uh, that came in and we, we actually, you know, actually signed the deal and really it, uh, it, it fell apart in early 2017. So my point is, uh, as an entrepreneur, there are always ups and downs. Okay. So, so that was probably the, the, the low point of my mm -hmm. career at BTCC, but it's about how you climb up and sort of uh, pick mm -hmm. yourself up after, after a sort of a, a bad round, right? So it's just, you know, you lose a round, but, but you don't, you don't lose, you don't lose the game. You, you keep going. Yeah. So that's the, that's the idea for persistence. Uh, you have to, you know, just got, you got to shake it off and, and you can't, at the time we didn't talk about it publicly. We didn't talk about it to the employees. So no one really knows the story because mm -hmm. it's not something you want to just brag yeah. about and talk about at the time. But, but with every success, what you don't see is with every success, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges, a lot of dark moments, a lot of uh, just, just it, it, every success is not easily achieved. So don't, yeah. Don't think that uh, road to success is easy. It's it's also it's not just a matter of luck either. It's hard work, persistence, and perse uh, perseverance. 
Absolutely. Everybody gets to see the acquisition that does go through, but not the one that yeah. falls. Through. Um, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Bobby, I want to get into ballet because I think it's one of the coolest things out there on the market right yeah. now. Have, you, have similar, you seen it? Have you seen one? I have not seen one physically. I've seen yeah, obviously it's, 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 online. Yeah. Um, I, I think what is so fascinating is you're living the same credo that you're putting out in the book that you're talking about, making it so tangible. I mean, I, the, exactly. uh, what was that? No, no, exactly right. This is making it yeah. easy for regular people. Um, I was watching SNL when Elon Musk hosted and, and it was funny, you know, he's on um, the, you know, Saturday Night Live skits and, and they're like, all right, so explain to me, what is Bitcoin? And like, wait, what, what is Bitcoin? <laughs> and like, wait, wait, can, can you re-explain it? And I think what you're doing is, yeah. is you're making it so easy for people to grasp and understand. Um, but before we even get into what you're doing, how you got there, talk, talk to us a bit about 2018, you sell off uh, BTCC, you step back, you take some time for yourself, and then you dive yes. back into ballet. What was that? Yeah, trajectory? yeah. At the time, at the time, I could have technically I could have retired, uh, having mm -hmm. sold the company. So I actually spent time uh, being a consultant, uh, doing uh, giving speeches. I was invited to all over the world to give speeches. It was at the tail end of the bull market, so a lot of conferences were still happening. They're paying big bucks for speakers and stuff like that. So I traveled the world, gave speeches all around the world, and um, and basically. That's when I kicked off the book project to write it, decided to write a book. So I, I started doing that, putting an outline together and get my thoughts on paper. But the, the other thing is by the end of that year, my, 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 some of my ex employees from BTCC were goading me on to say, Hey baby, Hey Bobby, we should, um, we should consider, you know, maybe um, doing something. We had this idea uh, from the BTCC mint days. The idea was a physical Bitcoin uh, coin, like a poker chip or titanium yeah. coin. And having uh, having a pre-made private key, very easy to use, have it loaded, and very simple, right? It's a bare asset. It was very popular, and uh, so our our invention is to how to turn it into a wallet. So basically, by January 2019, we got together, me and five other people. We really sat down and said, "Hey, let's let's launch a company. Let's uh, let's uh, create this company." At the time, it wasn't even called Ballet. We had different names in mind, but the end product is a simple device it's a cold storage cold storage by the way is the highest tier of safety right mm -hmm. you have traditionally you have the lowest tier of the pyramid is actually called the the custodial storage that's where most people have their coins they have it at exchanges they have a custodial wallets mm -hmm. basically they just have an account they log in they see the balance they're happy but the reality is these people don't have their cryptocurrency so if you store your bitcoins mm -hmm. on an exchange you don't own any bitcoin all you have is an account relationship with the bank and maybe the bank has it, maybe the bank doesn't have it. And you might get hacked, the bank it might get robbed. So there's all sorts of risks, right? The bank might not even have your coins to begin with, like at Mt. Gox, right? So that's the bottom, the base of the pyramid, the custodial storage. The next up is softer wallets where they have, where you own the cryptocurrency private keys. And that's where you have the bit 39, the seed phrases and all that. But all the softer wallets are too hard to use. I've been around for Bitcoin you know, for 10 years now, back then it was eight years. It was just too hard. It was just way, way too hard to use. So that's when I said that, hey, we got to find an easier solution. And and by the way, the highest tier is actually hardware wallets. These are devices, I don't want to name any competitors, but you know those names, uh, kind of like USB dongles. They have USB port, you run a cable. These days they have wireless, Bluetooth, NFC, all these fancy things, electronics, that have batteries, you charge it and stuff like that. But the point is, those are also too hard to use. I, I gave some out as gifts to my coworkers and my friends, and I realized, wait a minute, they can't use it. Yeah. I had to figure out myself how to use it. It took me a few hours. For them, it take, takes many, many hours, yeah. and I had to give a lecture to them on how to use it. So that's when the light bulb went off. If my colleagues at BTCC can't easily use harder wallets, then we, we have a problem here. So we invented the ballet wallet. It's the world's first physical. It's non-electronic. It's pre-set up, ready to go. You buy this on Amazon Bally Crypto, and it's ready to go. You buy it, and it's already got a Bitcoin QR code on it. That means that you could deposit Bitcoin just by scanning it. Mm. So if you know Bitcoin ATMs or people want to send you Bitcoin, you show up to them, they scan it, they can put Bitcoin on here. By the way, this also has multi-currency support. This is truly innovative. We have three patents on this already. So you can store Ethereum, Litecoin, Dogecoin, any coin you want, ERC-20 yeah. tokens. We even support NFCs. So any NFC 721 standard, ERC 721 standard, such as um, cyberpunks, such as CryptoKitties, you can store them yeah. on here. And then it becomes a physical bearer asset you have in your hands. Yeah. Okay, that means that 
as long as you don't lose this, you'll never get hacked. You'll never lose your cryptocurrency or crypto assets. So wow. this is the invention of ballet. It's the world's easiest, number one easiest to use wallet. And Bobby, everybody and it's very safe. can get one now, right? You pop on yeah, Amazon. You can buy one. This, you can go to Amazon. You can pick these up. You can buy one after you buy the book. Uh, yeah. You can come to our website, balletcrypto.com. Yeah. I, I also heard that perhaps some people might be able to sit down on the plane next to you like Bruce Willis did and end oh, up yes, with yes, a, yes. a card themselves. You got to tell us that's that story. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was uh, I was traveling back to uh, China after my Las Vegas trip in, uh, I think it was either October, November. It was November of 2019, right after we launched this. Okay, I had a few wallets in my, in my, in my bag. Uh, they're, they're, they come empty, okay? So they're empty wallets. And then I, I was in business class and Bruce Willis comes on board. It, it was just some guy with his family, okay? So at the time, I was like, ah, who, you know, like that guy looks familiar, okay? And by the way, they boarded the plane at the last minute. So like the door was about to close. Everyone's seated, you know, we, we the, the, it felt like the safety message was already announced. And at the last yeah. minute, like six people come on board. We're like, what's going on, and, you know? And then uh, turns out it was Bruce Willis. Um, I, I figured it out because I, I heard a flight attendant call him, Mr. Willis, what would you like as uh, for a drink, you know? Wow. So I was like, ah, maybe that's Bruce Willis. So I, I nudged him uh, um, uh, just to chat about it. But he didn't want to talk, so I talked to his, uh, I think his wife a little bit. And uh, I, I basically, they had two daughters, I think, and I gave them each a, uh, a Bitcoin wallet. So I had to, I actually loaded it in flight, okay? So what happened was, after the plane took off, I turned on the airport air, air, airline Wi-Fi, the airplane Wi-Fi. I was able to send Bitcoins onto the ballet wallets on an airplane, wow. okay? And then I gave them each. I think at the time, it was just $100 worth of Bitcoin. Um, so I forgot. forgot It, it was $100, so it must have been around $10,000, like 0.01 BTC Wow. At the time, and today, you know, it's worth you know four or five hundred dollars. Yeah, <laughs> unbelievable and a crazy story. Uh, and I'm yeah. sure I, ho I hope they have it. I don't know if they have it anymore. I hope they have it. They don't lose it. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, they just can't lose it. It's secure as long as they don't lose it. Um, yeah. Exactly. I, I, what I think is so interesting too is um, it's it's so accessible. Like I I feel like I could give it to my grandpa and he'd be like, oh, I get it. Like it makes sense now. Yes. Versus, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's great for it's great for the elderly. If you have parents, grandparents, Father's Day is coming up. We just had Mother's Day. You can load crypto on here and give it to your father, and he doesn't need to do anything. He says, "Happy Father's Day." Here's some Bitcoin. Just keep it, hodl it for a few years, right? And then when yeah. they need to sell it, they'll, they'll tell you they want to sell it. You can figure out how to do it. It's not that hard. Um, yeah. It's completely decentralized. Even if my company goes out of business, the wallet, the private keys are on yeah. here. It's a complete open standard. It's a non-proprietary standard. It's a uh, it's open source standard BIP thirty eight. So it's it, it's the only wallet that was designed for a twenty year lifespan. Think about that. I think about hodl hodling for twenty years. So if you put Bitcoin and cryptocurrency on here, uh, you put in the case, leave it. You could leave it in a time capsule, leave it, hide it somewhere, and then twenty years later, the funds will still be here. You will not lose it. There's no future maintenance. There's no firmware to upgrade. There's no software rot. There's nothing. That's right. It's going to be here. So it's very easy. It's also great for children. If you have children, you know, birthday gifts, Christmas, holiday, Hanukkah, you know, bar mitzvahs, you can have even tooth fairy. Someone told me they gave their daughter a, a Bitcoin for a tooth fairy. Right? That's a great idea. Right? You slide under their pillow, uh, tooth fairy gift, right? So it's, it teaches them how to save money, right? You, you can have the same wallet every year you add to it. For, for birthday, imagine the child say, hey, yeah, give me some Bitcoin for my birthday, you know, <laughs> and uncles and aunties, and you load them up with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Yeah, I, I'd be one smart kid. I mean, I, I mean, that's what I got. That's what I should have done back in the day. Exactly, I, exactly. Uh, yeah. Bobby, it's very affordable, $35. Yeah. Uh, something that I learned when I, when I was researching you before we got here is that you have an entrepreneurial background in your family as well. Your parents had a flip flop, flip flop factory. Your brother has created That's a right. currency. Did you know growing up that you were going to become an entrepreneur or, or how did it inform your childhood to get you to where you are now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, at the time when I was growing up, the word entrepreneur wasn't really in the vocabulary. I think the, the word that we thought about was businessman. I mm -hmm. knew from my father was a businessman. My grandfather was a businessman. My book was that de is dedicated to my grandfather who passed away last year. Mm -hmm. So he's a, he's a, what I call the uh, penultimate uh, 
businessman. And I grew up wanting to be a businessman. I, I've always grown up wanting to be a businessman, meaning you know, to run your own company, that kind of stuff. In today's terms, that would be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Um, so, however, you know, at, as a career, you know, I start, I went to a good school, I had a fortune to have a good education, uh, go to a good school and come out and also worked at some great companies. So I was sort of a career sort of a executive, if you will, on that track. But finally, after leaving Walmart in 2012, I was able to sort of shift my career into the businessman track. Um, I also did a, I, by that year, 2012, I took a uh, executive MBA program at a business school in China called CEIBS, a China Europe International Business School. So I attended that for two years. It was a sort of part-time evening business school program, executive MBA program. And that actually gave me the confidence to sort of uh, do my own thing. So I, uh, I was glad to have partaken in that program. And then that gave me the confidence to really come out and sort of launch my own company. Yeah. Bobby, you are awesome. I, I somehow made it right to the end of our time here. But before I let you go, I always love to finish with this question, which is looking back now, I, you've done so many incredible things. Uh, aside from you know maybe uh, invest in Bitcoin, what advice would you give to the 20-year-old version of yourself looking back now? To the 20-year-old version of myself, I, I think in hindsight, one of the things is I, uh, I stayed at Yahoo for eight years. In hindsight, I should have... Uh, I probably didn't need to stay there that long. I probably could have left after four years, five years, tried different companies. Um, so mm-hmm. on the one hand, it's good to be loyal. It's good to be, you know, stick it out. Uh, don't change jobs every one or two years. But at the same time, if you're finding that you've been working at a company for five, eight, 10 years, uh, it might make sense to move around and, and just see a change of landscape. So when I say that, I, I don't mean you should change jobs every year. I see a lot of people on resumes job hopping every year, every 18 months, they have a different job. That's, that's not good. That's not good. You want to be able to join a company, really go in there, uh, you know, grow your roots in there, so to speak, put down roots and really, you know, get a promotion, get your promotion, really work on a variety of things at the company. And then you move on and, and bring that knowledge and bring that experience with you. So, so um, yeah, so I think career is very important. I, you know, in terms of should, should I have started a company right out of college? You know, some people say, Bobby, you're such a great entrepreneur. You should, just, you should have just started it right out of college. I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a tough question. There are a lot of successful entrepreneurs who dropped out of college, started their companies, turned into great things. Um, but at the same time, I, I benefited from my years of experience uh, in, in, the, in the workforce as a lowly engineer to a manager to a senior executive. So I, I benefit from that. Yeah. Mm. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us for everything you've shared. We'll make sure all of the links are dropped in the episode notes. We'll drop the link to the book. Congrats again on the publication of The Promises of Bitcoin. And we'll make sure everybody's getting a ballet card ASAP so that they can start trading in cryptocurrency. And I know now, if anybody asks me, how do I learn about cryptocurrency? It's not. Go talk to Bobby Lee for two hours. Pick up the book on Amazon. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Amazing. Very good. Bobby, thank you for joining us here on Mentor Momentum with NextGen HQ. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. That guy is unbelievable. I, my mind is absolutely blown. As somebody, honestly, who has not delved enough into the cryptocurrency world, Bobby makes it so easy and accessible for people to understand and get started and grow and scale from there. And I mean, talk about an incredible yet humble entrepreneur who shared so many incredible stories about how he got from where he started to where he is now and how he continues to learn every day. I love how he said it's his 10th anniversary about learning about Bitcoin. So I I know we got some incredible cryptocurrency experts in the community. Paul McNeil, shout out to you. I love anybody's thoughts on this episode. What else they want to know? What else they want to learn from these incredible mentors that are in our ecosystem? But that was absolutely amazing. A huge shout out to Bobby Lee. This has been Mentor Momentum with NextGen HQ. We'll catch you next time.